Okay, classification. Where is the fascia? In fact, we have two kinds of classifications and I will highlight just the classic one. And the classic one describes the superficial and the deep fascia planes. But please keep in mind that, in fact, this is also wrong. You know, we have done a description of the fascia in a superficial and a, in a deep plane, but it is ridiculous because already we're doing the same thing that they've done for two and a half thousand years. They try to simplify. And I will do this because I need to explain the fascia system, but please keep in mind that the fascia system is a never ending three dimensional continuity. Okay. Okay. The classic classification is described fascia with loose density and high or uh, irregularity. And depending on the density and the regularity, we're talking about a certain kind of tissue. Is there is a lot of regular, uh, regularity and there is a lot of density. We're talking about tendons and ligaments. And is this uh, really loose density and irregular? We're talking about loose connective tissue or superficial fascia. Stecco described this classification a little bit more in detail. As he said, the superficial fascia is between this, uh, the sublayer of the skin. And the deep fascia consists of the aponeurotic fascia and the myofascia. So superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is um, the layer which separates the superficial adipose tissue and the deep adipose tissue. So when you cut the skin, like I did in this image, and I raise the skin, you will see a superficial fascia layer, which image is attached to the skin. Then you will see a, a, a plane. It's really loose mesh connective tissue plane. And then you have another fat tissue layer beneath and then you will see the deep fascia layer. So in fact, when you're working with the skin, also as a physical therapist or a massage therapist or whatever you do, this is the area where you, where you have the most influence. Um, but as I said, it's a three-dimensional continuity. So there are some um, studs connecting the, the skin with the superficial fascia and the deep fascia, which is also attached to the myofascia. And this is, uh, this is how it looks like when you lift the skin with somebody without fat, <laughs> you have a lot of connective tissue. And the, the design of the superficial fascia provides us different function of the skin. When there is not a lot of fat and the fascia tissue is stiff and strong beneath the skin, there's no movement of the skin towards the deep fascia. And this is really important, for example, in the hand, in the palm of the hand. If you open a pot of, of mayonnaise or something, and this skin will be as loose as the skin on my arm, I would never be capable of opening a jaw, okay? So my skin will turn with the jar and I won't be capable, capable of opening. But in the meanwhile, or in the same time, when, for example, the skin of my eyelid has too much fibrosis or too much strong connective tissue, I wouldn't be capable of blinking my eye a thousand times a day. So depending on where we are in the body, the, the, the way that the superficial fascia is designed is different. And this, you also have to be aware as a physical therapist or a massage therapist, because it's very nice to treat people with massage therapy, but be, not being aware of this kind of different systems may want you to, to change this in a normal situation. The deep fascia consists of the aponeurotic fascia and the myofascia. Well, the aponeurotic fascia, I think, is the most, most interesting piece of fascia that we have. In fact, an aponeurosis, in my opinion, is a flat tendon. Because as I, as I explained to you in the, in the embryology, the, the, the endoperian epimysium of a muscle, the connective tissue surrounding a muscle cell, a muscle bundle, and a muscle, and the entire muscle in length is a tendon. So the myofascia of my biceps is my biceps tendon. My biceps tendon is my bicep without muscle fibers, okay? And for the aponeurosis, you have, you have two kinds of aponeurosis. 
the aponeurosis, for example, um, the thoracolumbar fascia, which we'll discuss in a, in a bit, is a continuation of the fascia of the latissimus dorsi and the gluteus maximus. So meaning that when you contract a flat muscle, that you will pull on the aponeurosis. Think about the abdominal aponeurosis or iliotibial tract, or and I can continue as long as I want. And then keep in mind that this aponeurosis is, is, is charged with mechanical receptors providing uh, proprioceptive information. Um, yes. Just a detail, aponeurotic fascia can consist of several layers, depending on how many muscles provide this aponeurosis with, with tissue. These layers can be in different directions. And that's all necessary to transport transponent muscle strength. And I will get back to this in a second when we talk about um, myofascia strain, uh, yeah, the strains of myofascia. The epidermotic fascia can be seen as an ectoskeleton. In fact, when I take away the skin and the fat tissue of a human body, the human body still has a wetsuit on. And this wetsuit is all this kind of tissue, only epidermotic tissue. It's providing us an environment for our muscles to contract. If you have your upper leg and the fascia wouldn't be there, the contraction would never have the strength on the lower leg when it's not restricted by its form. It's a really, really important structure. It's also important for venous drainage and uh, flow of uh, lymphatic fluids. Okay, then the myofascia. It's, it's what I said, the epimysium, the um, endomysium and the perimysium in continuity are the tendons. And here you see that I lift, this is from Stecco, but it's the same kind of images where I lift the apomysium. And is in this video, you'll see that I dissect the apomysium. This is what I've done for two and a half thousand years, taking away all connective tissue just to have a better view of the muscles beneath. But look how strong this muscle is, this apomysium is attached to the connective tissue within the muscle. And within the muscle, it's a perimysium. So the apomysium is connected to the perimysium. And with this image, you see a lot of connective tissue. And this is normal. This is a normal view of a muscle. And you see that all these this bundles can be separated because of the uh, perimysium. And in these bundles, there are a lot of muscle fibers, which are also surrounded by connective tissue called the endomysium. But please keep in mind, it's three-dimensional. I'm just putting the skin and you see the connective tissue layers and the attachments of this connective tissue towards the deeper muscles. This is in the neck. So you see what you see here, the muscle you see here is uh, the platysma muscle, part of the platysma muscle. No, sternocleidomastridis uh, muscle. So in fact, when we talk about the fascia system, we can discuss, or when we talk about the human body, we can discuss if we exist of all separated structures like muscles, tendons, and etc., or that we have to consider that the human body consists of, of, of a three dimensional continuity system. And within this system, we have our organs, our muscles, our bones, and our other tissue. I think this new way of thinking will help us a lot of understanding pathologies. Uh, poor movement uh, capabilities, but also why we get uh, a sore neck when we are sitting like how I sit right now. You know, I get a sore neck when I do this for more than an hour. I understand why, because of this three-dimensional connective tissue system.